ഹമ്മദിലഹിനുഹുനസ്തഹുഹുനസ്തഹുഹുനസ്തഹുഹുനസ്തഹുഹുനസ്തഹുഹുനസ്തഹുഹുനസ്തഹുഹുനസ്ത
So I hope no one sees me as the people see you. When you say, it's not permissible to do this Mawla the Nabawi, not because you don't love Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but because it's not legislated. The first thing people say is, you don't love Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. قُلْ إِنْ كَانَ لِلْرَّحْمَانِ وَلَدٌ فَأَنَا أَوَّلُ الْعَابِدِينَ if Ar-Rahman has a son, then I'm the first of those who is going to worship that son. So I say to the community, anyone who's here present, anyone who's going to hear this later on at any time, bring us the Dalil and help us to comprehend this issue. I'm a revert to Islam. You people have been Muslims for a long time. Bring me the proof and I'm going to get on our member and other manabir throughout this country and we're going to encourage the people to do the mawlid and nebawi because it be, it's been established with dalil but until a person can do that kalla wallahi we're against it and it is an innovation and it should be avoided so what I'm going to do today inshallah is I'm going to deal with some of the main proofs that the people use ayat of the Quran out of context a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, out of context. A hadith of the Nabi وسلم, that are not authentic. Dreams that people have had that are used as delil. Before I do that though, inshallah, I just want to give you a historical background of the Mawlid and Nabawi. And I see many faces of young people who are here. Our elders from our grandmothers and grandfathers, great grandmothers and great grandfathers, they used to buy into these types of issues because the imams and people who taught them, our relatives, the older people, they didn't know how to read and write many times. But today, we don't have that excuse. With the explosion of knowledge on the internet, so much information is out there. Don't be a person who doesn't use your intellect. Allah has given us an intellect. So I wanna ask the Ummah of Al-Islam, where is our intellect in regards to this historical fact? For the first 300 years in El Islam, 300, 300, the first 300 years that the Prophet وسلم, when he was asked, who's the best of this ummah, Ya Rasulullah? He told the people, the best of this ummah are the people that I was sent to, Abu Bakr and Uthman, the first 100 years. And then after them, the second 100 years. And then after them, the third 100 years. So those three centuries, 300 years, are the best years in Al-Islam. They are the best years. Those are the years in which the awliya of Allah were plentiful. The ulama of Al-Islam were plentiful. The people of At-Taqwa were plentiful. For over 300 years, you didn't find the Muslims anywhere in the Muslim world. Anywhere. You didn't find a grave that was being worshipped along with Allah for 300 years. You didn't find a mausoleum built over a dead person or a saint for 300 years. The Prophet's grave, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, was his grave, but the people did not make it their niyat to go to that grave to worship it for 300 years. Likewise, for over 300 years, no one in the Muslim empire did the Mawlid and Nabawi, not a single person for over 300 years. This issue was introduced to this ummah in the fourth century. And it was introduced by the Fatimiyun. The Fatimiyun are a group of Shiite who curse Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman, who believe that the Quran is incomplete, who said that Aisha radiallahu anha is a zaniya. All of those things that they believe, they have ilhad. These are the people who gave us the Mawlid and Nabawi. Just to give you an idea of who these people are, who they are. In the ninth century, these people, they came from Egypt. They went to Mecca and they made the blood of the Muslims halal at the Kaaba. They started decimating and killing Muslims at the Kaaba. They started taking the women and raping the women and killing the women and the children at the Kaaba. If you were a free person, they caught you, you became a slave. If they didn't kill you, they took you back to Egypt with them. They didn't stop there. These Fatimiyun, the dead bodies of the Muslims who they killed, they picked their bodies up and they threw them in the well of Zamzam. In the well of Zamzam. Out of all of the places, it goes to show 
the nature of that individual. The Arabs have a, sta a statement, if you want to become famous, urinate in the water of Zemzem. Because everyone's going to say, oh, that guy urinated in Zemzem. Because it's well known, if anyone does a sacrilegious act like that, he has no deen, no taqwa. But he'll become famous for the wrong reason. The point is, every Muslim loves Zemzem. They threw the dead bodies in the Zemzem well. They didn't stop there. They went to the Kaaba, and they took the black stone off of the Kaaba, and they went with it back to Egypt. They took the Muslims who were living in Mecca as slaves back to Egypt, those who they didn't kill, and they took with them the black stone. Now, I'm not a worshiper of the personality of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and I'm definitely not a worshiper of a stone. The black stone, we don't worship it, as Umar said, radiallahu anhu. I know that you're just a rock. You can't help me, you can't harm me. But I saw the Prophet kiss you. If I didn't see that, then I wouldn't kiss you. But still, the black stone is a symbol of our religion. It's a symbol of our religion. It came from the heavens, it came down. The Prophet said it was white as the driven snow. But when the people touched it and kissed it, it became black because it's a kafar. It takes off the sins of the people who touch it correctly. They took the black stone for 20 years. These are the people who gave us the motive, the Nabawi. Where is the intellect of the Ummah of Al-Islam? Where is the intellect? Someone comes to me. Someone enslaved me, my grandfather, my forefathers, took me from the country I came from, changed everything about who I am and how I live, what I believe in. And then he's going to give me a gift and I'm going to accept it. I'm going to look at him as an enemy, as if he is crazy. He has to give me something for me to take that's indisputable. He gives me a glass of water, I'll take it because I need it. But I'm not going to take anyone, anything from my enemy, especially when that enemy is an enemy in religion, in the deen. What I believe in, what he believes is diametrically opposed. Those are the people who gave us the moulded the nebel. Curses of Abu Bakr and Umar. After that, they did the Mawlid the Nabawi, the Muslims did the Mawlid the Nabawi for about 80 years, 85 years. And then a group of people called the Ayyubiyun, they took over. They defeated the Fatimiyin and they took over. The Ayyubiyun stopped the Mawlid the Nabawi. In the 5th century, after 500 years, they stopped the Mawlid the Nabawi. Because the ulama said this is not from Al Islam and they were in control, so they didn't let it happen. For over 200 years, there was no Molid and Nebawi. Over 200 years, there was no Molid and Nebawi. Started in 400, it was stopped at 500, it started again in the 7th century. In the 7th century, it was reinstated by a king during that time, the king of Irbil. His name was Mudaffir Kaukaburi. This man, as Al Imam al Suyuti mentioned, he mentioned about what he did. He cooked for the people 5,000 roasted lambs. He cooked for the people 10,000 chickens. He gave the people 10,000 bowls of cream. He gave the people 30,000 bowls of, free, of sweet dishes. He gave the people who made poetry. If you made a nice line of poetry for the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam speaking about him, he will give you 1,000 gold dinars. And then Muslims started to do this all over the Muslim world in different shapes, forms, and fashions. As you can see here in the city of Birmingham, where the people, they look at the Mawlid al Nabawi as an Eid. They put more energy in the Mawlid al Nabawi than they do for Friday. Friday is a legislated Eid. It's our weekly Eid, something you're supposed to do a lot of things concerning it. You're supposed to wear nice clothes, you're supposed to smell nice, certain things you do. Some of the people put more emphasis on the Mawlid and Nabawi or just as much like the Eid al-Adha and the Eid al-Fitr. But when you ask them where does it come from, they don't even know it came from the Fatimiyin. So that's the historical backdrop of the Mawlid and Nabawi. If we were to stop right here and we were to get up and we were to leave, I would think a person who didn't know would go back and research what I said. And look what Al Imam Al Suyuti said in his book Al Hawi, Al Imam Ibn Kathir and Bidaya Wal Nihaya. Someone goes and he finds this historically. He says, Man, that's enough for me. Someone who hated Abu Bakr Umar Uthman said that Aisha was this, the Quran is incomplete, the Mahdi is going to do this and do that. I'm not taking anything from those people. And that's why they 
celebrate the Mawlid al-Nabawi on the 17th day of Rabi al-Awwal. Sunnis on the 12th of Rabi al-Awwal and they on the 17th. Not to mention how Allah Azza wa Jalla, He has not allowed Bani Adam at this point to know the birthday of any Nabi. We don't know the birthday of any Nabi. And that is from the wisdom of Allah Azza wa Jalla. He knows that his servants have the propensity of going overboard. That shirk was introduced to the people because we go overboard in personalities. So from the scholars are those who say that he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was born on different days in Rabi al -Awn. Different days. Others say he was born in Muharram. Others say that he was born in Ramadan. Other ulama said he was born in Rajab. Others say we don't know. All we know is he was born on Monday or Thursday. That's all we know. We know that he was born in the year of the elephant. That's all we know. Like Musa. We knew that when Musa was born and he was young, just an infant. We know that he was in Egypt. We know that his mother put him in the basket in the water and it went down the river. We know that. Isa ibn Maryam. We knew that he's a Hebrew. We knew that he was born without a father. But what day he was born? No one knows these issues. No one knows these issues. After dealing with that, that's a proof against the people who do this. The day that you're doing this issue is similar to the Christians who their biggest day, Christmas, one of the two big holidays for them. Jesus died on Easter night, rose up three days after that, and he was born on Christmas. Muslims, when we look at that, we laugh because it's clearly in our religion telling us this is impossible. What you people are doing is impossible. Our religion is built upon this issue. We emphatically state, this is kithib, because the Qur'an said he wasn't killed. The Qur'an said he wasn't killed. And what you're talking about, the day and the time that he was born, is impossible because of other issues that we know about. Similar to that, as I sit here, I have no doubt whatsoever. As I sit here, just as I know the Yehud and the Nasar are lying, I have no doubt that the Muslims who say his birthday is the 12th of this month, Rabil Awwal, they have no delir. Not a single shred of delil, not one. So what are some of the proofs that they use to do the mawlid and nabawi? What are some of the proofs? There are a number of delils that they use. The first one, Ikhwani, is the old adage. The one that we still hear the Juhal and the Sufaha using. And that delil is, there are bona fide scholars who believed, and they said that the mawlid and nabawi is permissible. Who are you to come and say that those scholars didn't know? Are you better than those scholars? Do you know and they don't know? You're just a revert. You've been in Islam for only 20 years. Those scholars were given fatwas in Mecca and Medina and wherever they were in Bayt al maqdis for 60, 70, 80 years. That's the first delil. And it is a fact, Ummat al-Islam, that there are ulama who we respect and honor who did take this opinion. From them, the great scholar Al Imam Al Suyuti. From them, the great scholar Al Imam Al Sakhawi. From them, Al Imam Ibn Hajar Al Asqalani. Those ulama are from the ulama of Al Hadith. Ulama of Al Hadith. They serviced the Sunnah. No doubt about that. Those three scholars. And other than them, are you claiming that you know more than they know? I'm not claiming that. But what I will say is, the aqidah of the people of Alul Hadith, like these three Imams, and other than them, and from them us, inshallah, from our aqidah is there's only one person who is ma'asum, and that is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Everybody else makes mistakes. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the beginning of Surah Al A'raf, He said in the Quran, Ittabi'u ma unzila ilaykum min rabbikum, wa la tattabi'u min dunihi awliya. Follow what has been revealed to you from your Lord. Don't follow your culture. That's not divinely revealed. Don't follow the dastur of this country or that country. Don't follow that. Follow what has been revealed to you from your Lord. And do not follow the awliya. How little it is that you people think and reflect. This ayah was revealed concerning the people of Mecca who had their awliya. Abu Lahab, Abu Jahl, people from their grandfathers who told them to worship Latin, Manat, and other than that. Allah said, don't follow the awliya, people you took as awliya. 
So as a Muslim, Allah Ta'ala has commanded in this ayat and other ayahs that we follow the Quran and the Sunnah, what was revealed by Allah and what was brought by His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi Wasallam. So I just want to give you a quick example, Ikhwani, about Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. My aqidah is there's no human being better than Abu Bakr al-Siddiq with the exception of the prophets and the messengers. He along with Umar, those two will be the leaders of older people, the kuhul and jannah as the prophet said. That's my aqidah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But even Abu Bakr, and I say again, after seeing some crazy statements of people who are teaching others, I say again, it's not permissible for us to blindly follow Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Taqlid al-A'ma is not permissible to do with anyone except the Nabi of Al-Islam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When the Prophet died and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu came to Umar and he told Umar, Umar, stop talking, stop talking. Umar just didn't listen to Abu Bakr. He kept going on. He had his own point of view. He had his own opinion until he heard the ayat and the dalil. Then he calmed down. When the people had ikhtilaf, where should we bury the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Abu Bakr told them, the Dalil, this is what I heard. He said he should be buried, the prophets, wherever they die. So bury him where he died at. When the Ansar were having ikhtilaf, we're going to be the leaders and you people choose your own leader. Abu Bakr gave them the Dalil. When they heard the Dalil, they followed it. They just didn't say, Abu Bakr is, with, is not with us. Abu Bakr just didn't say, I'm the best of the Ummah, do what I say. Abu Bakr has to bring the Dalil like everybody else, radiallahu anhu. And I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. That's the deen. Because Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, for his big position in Jannah, and he's from the awliya of Allah, he's not ma'asoom. And that's why Fatima, the daughter of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when she came after the death of the Nabi with Ali, and they wanted the money, the mirath of Fatima, he wanted the money, her father is dead, she wants her inheritance. Abu Bakr said, I don't know that you have any inheritance because the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the Prophets, they're not inherited from. They don't leave any money behind. When he said that, Fatima, she just submitted. Ali just submitted. It's no problem because he brought the Dalil. All of the companions were against Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu when he said, we're going to fight those Muslims who are not giving us the zakat. All of them, everybody was against them. At the top of the list, Umar. Abu Bakr had to convince him, give him the proofs. Why is he taking that position? And then the people agreed. That's a great lesson for us, Ikhwani. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, the rest of those companions, any individual, your sheikh, any individual, he has to bring the Dalil. Secondly, Ikhwani, concerning this Dalil, ulama said it, bigger than us. What about them? What about them? Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, وَنَرْفَعُوا دَرَجَاتٍ مَنْ نَشَاءٍ we raise up in degrees whoever we want to raise up in degree. And no doubt, Al Imam al Sakhawi al Suyuti, Al Imam ibn Hajar, Abu Shama, these people were raising degrees above us in knowledge, no doubt. The ayah said, we raise people in degrees as we choose, whoever we want to raise in degrees. And above everyone who has knowledge is another person who has knowledge. Everyone who has knowledge, someone ab is above him with knowledge. So Musa has knowledge, and someone has more knowledge than Musa. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has knowledge, and someone is above Muhammad with knowledge. Jibril has knowledge, someone is above Jibril with knowledge, in terms of knowledge. Allah ta'ala is al-alim. No one is above Allah in his knowledge. His knowledge is not preceded by not knowing. His knowledge is not mixed up with forgetfulness. His knowledge is complete and exact. Befits his majesty. So the point is, yes, these three scholars, four scholars other than them, they're bigger than us. But above them are those who are bigger and more than them in number who took the other position. So if you're going to make us responsible for taking their position because of their knowledge, what about those who have more knowledge than them? From them, the top of the list is the muballigh of this deen, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He didn't mention this issue. So if you're against it, 
what's the problem that someone would have that you're against it? Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, the Khulafa, Rashidin, the ulama from the companions, they were not with this. The tabi'een who came after them, they didn't know anything about this. The atba'i tabi'een, they didn't know anything about this. The four imams of al-Islam, greater than those imams, they didn't mention this, they didn't know about this. You're not going to find in the books of the four madhahib. Ya yeah, Shaykh, what's the ruling of the madhahib? You're not going to find this because it wasn't present, it wasn't an issue for those imams and those scholars. So that dalil in and of itself is faulty. Don't be a person who your religion is, the Shaykh said. We respect personalities and we respect people, but we hold on to principles and everyone has to get with the principle. So I categorically say and I reject that man who I saw recently, subhanAllah, saying that I'm against Abu Bakr, I must be a Shiite because I say Abu Bakr has to bring the Dalil. You can't make Taqlid al-A'ma. Abu Bakr, Allah didn't make us responsible for following him by himself. We follow Abu Bakr, Umar Uthman, and Ali and those rest of the companions when what they say is in accordance to the Kitab and the Sunnah when they have ijma on something. Concerning the next issue, Khwani, is that they use the Dalil of a hadith that's been collected by Imam al-Bayhaqi. Great scholar and muhaddith from Ahl al-Sunnah, from Ahl al-Hadith, wrote a number of books. He brought the statement of Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu. We've used this statement, making dalil with it in the past. Anas said about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, aqan nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam an nafsihi ba'du ma bu'itha nabiyan. The Prophet made an aqiqah for himself after he was sent as a Nabi. They use that as a delil. I don't think it's a secret for those of you who know me, from the scholars who I love during this time, and I would say he's my favorite scholar even, for different reasons. One of the main reasons, the door of a Salafi was opened on me through him, by the permission of Allah. And that is none other than Al-Imam Al-Albani. I love him more than everybody else. Al-Albani said that this hadith is Hassan in his Silsila, Al-Hadith al sahiha he said it's Hassan. It has multiple chains of narration. He believes they're all weak, but they combine, raise it to the level of Hassan al-Ghayri. But there are those scholars who reject this hadith. Al-Imam Ahmed said it was weak. Al-Imam Ibn Hiban al-Bayhaqi, Ibn Hajar al nawawi Ibn al-Qayyim, they all said it's weak because in the chain of narration is a narrator who was munkar. After studying the hadith, after once using it, after looking at it the best that I could, asking people, came to the conclusion, this hadith is weak. In my opinion, Al-Albani made a mistake because we have the ability, we have the ability, people of the sunnah, and al hadith the Muslims should have the ability to realize other than the Nabi of Al-Islam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam If there's a human being You agree with everything that he said Every position that he took You agree with him There's not a single position that he took That you disagreed with that position If that's your situation Then there's something wrong with that equation You can't agree with the position of everyone Because everyone to the exclusion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam they're going to make mistakes. All of Adam's sons, all of his children, they make mistakes. And the best of them are the ones who make toba after their mistakes. They make a mistake, they come back from it. So here we are. We don't say, if Al-Albani Al said it, then we have to take it. If Al-Imam Abu Hanifa said it, then it must be the truth. Nah, that's not our deen. This hadith is da'if, da'if, it's weak. In the chain of narration are liars. In the chain of narration are people who go against what fiqat people say. The hadith has been judged as being munkar. Munkar is the hadith when good people go against a weak person. A weak person says something and strong people say something else. His hadith is called munkar because it went against those good people. What's been established about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam After seven days After his birth His uncle Abdul Muttalab He made an aqiqah For Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And Rasulullah Didn't make an aqiqah For himself after that And why should he And why does he have to No one is responsible For what happened When he was little 
I don't have to go back and make an aqiqah for myself. My parents raised me up as a kafir. It's not my responsibility. Which brings us to another point that you have to consider about this dalil. This dalil. Why don't we have the companions doing the same thing for themselves? Forget the mawlid. Forget that. Why didn't the companions? You know, from the companions, Abu Bakr didn't make shirk with Allah. Uthman didn't make shirk. Ali didn't make shirk. Small minority of them didn't make shirk. Minority. The vast majority of them used to make shirk with Allah. So when they became Muslims, when the Prophet did an aqiqah for himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, why didn't they make aqiqahs for themselves as well? It's the sunnah. Now, this question that I'm posing to you people, you brothers and sisters, I think you have to look at it through the prism of this point. Some of the companions came and said, Ya Rasulullah, give us permission to castrate ourselves. We're ready to castrate ourselves. So we don't have desire for women. We can just worship Allah. That's it. That's how committed and sincere they were. We don't have to tell you about their sacrifices in jihad. Now, do you think for one second, if the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sunnah was to make an aqita for himself, not a single companion after that is going to do it? So how is this used as a dalil? How is it used as a dalil? That he made an aqita, so because he, rec he paid attention to his birthday, now we're going to do all of these things, flowers and dhikrs and all of this, lights and dhikr. This is a hadith that is da'if, and the da'if hadith, can't be used for aqidah and they can't be used in the ahkam and they can't be used if the weakness is severe as it is in this particular case. In addition to that, Ikhwani, from what these people use, what our brothers and sisters use who want to practice the mawlid, a religious issue, like Christmas is religious for the Christians, is that the people say that we have been commanded in the Quran to be happy and to show our happiness as a result of the fadl of Allah and the rahmah of Allah. You have to give thanks to Allah and give shukr for the fadl that he bestowed upon you and the rahmah that he bestowed upon you. You have to show thanks for that. And we agree. They use an ayat of the Quran. In Surah Yunus, Allah Ta'ala said in this ayat number 58, Qul, Tell them, Ya Muhammad, because of the fadl of Allah and because of the rahmah of Allah, you people should show happiness. The fadl of Allah and the rahmah of Allah, you should show happiness. The people who practice the Prophet's birthday, this celebration, they say that the delil here is that is there any greater virtue and any greater rahmah than the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being born? And I agree, I agree. The Messenger of Allah's birth Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a rahmah to the people and his fadl. Allah didn't send him except as a rahmah. He himself said that he was a rahmah. We agree with that. It's a fadl as well. But now the question is again, that tafsir, that the fadl of Allah and the rahmah of Allah in this ayat in Surah Yunus, it means celebrating his birthday. This is what you will find in the books that they have written, that this is the tafsir of this. It means celebrating his birthday. The question that presents itself is, where did the scholars who we rely upon mention this tafsir in their books? There are many, many books of tafsir. It doesn't make any sense sitting here and reading a list of those books. There are many from the Qudama and from the Muta'akhirin. Many, many books of recognized tafasir and all different kinds of things. Tafsir of the ahkam. Just about the ahkam. That's all it pays attention to. Tafsir about the irab of the Quran. So many books of tafsir. Where did one scholar mention this? Not one. Not one of the recognized scholars. You know who give these interpretations? You know? It's the people of the Tasawwuf. It's the people who come later, who through hook or crook, they want to make these things fit their religion. The Qadianis, people like that. Any and everyone can take the Quran and make it fit to mean what they want it to mean. The nation of Islam in America, the nation of Islam, Kuffar, they use the Quran to show that the white man is a devil. 
Other people use the Quran to show that Ghulam Ahmed is a Rasul after the Nabi. Other people use the Quran to show that Aisha, Aisha has been cursed. You can use the Quran for whatever you want. You can use the Sunnah for whatever you want. But we say, we say, Ummat al-Islam, this Quran and that Sunnah in our nose is a ring. In our ears are rings. And that ring, those, those ropes that connect our ears and our noses around our neck is a ring. All of those ropes, they're connected to the body of the companions. We understand that Quran and the Sunnah the way they understood it. We're being pulled like that. Once you cut those ropes off and you have the liberty to say what you want to say, then the person is going to come and say, in the Quran is an ayat that allows you to have nine wives. Nine wives in the Quran. People used it to prove that. So where did the scholars of Islam say this? You want to know what the scholars of Islam said about this ayat? The scholars of Islam, like what Al Imam Al Hakim, what he brought, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Al Imam Al Hakim brought his chain of narration, and our religion is based upon the chain of narration. Not like the Yehud and the Nasara, say whatever you want to say. We can prove Allah said this, because the chain of narration is connected from the young boy sitting in this masjid right now. He memorizes Quran word for word. If he makes a mistake or the Imam makes a mistake reciting the Quran, that young boy will correct him because that Quran was handed down to us through the chain of narration. What the Prophet said, what he did, what Allah said, and so forth and so on. Not like the Yahud and the Nasara. Jesus was born 25th of December. Okay, that's it. You just have to accept that. You're not accepting that at all, at all. So in this regard, Ikhwani, Al-Imam Al-Hakam, he brought his chain of narration up until the Tabi'i by the name of Abza. Abza, he said, I was sitting with Ubay ibn Ka'b, one of the ulama of the Quran, from the companions. Ubay ibn Ka'b told him that the Prophet came to Ubay, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, radiyallahu anhu, and the Rasul said to Ubay, لَقَدْ أُنزِلَتْ عَلَيَّ سُورَةٌ أُمِرْتُ أَنْ أُقْرِئُكَهَا There is a surah that has been revealed upon me, Ya Ubay. It came down just now. I've been ordered, commanded to read this surah to you. Ubay said to the Nabi Sallallahu Ya Rasulullah, was I mentioned by my name? Allah told you to read this surah to Ubay ibn Uqab? The Prophet said, yes. You were mentioned by your name. That's from the virtues of Ubay ibn Uqab. The student of Ubay Abza, when he heard that from Ubay, he said, Ya Abu al-Mundir, Abu Mundir is Ubay. Were you happy when you found that out? He said, Wallahi, I was happy. And what would prevent me from being happy? When Allah Azza wa mentioned in the Quran, Qul, Bi fadlillahi wa bi rahmatihi, fa bi dhalika fal yafrahu. Allah used this ayah because of the fadl of Allah and his rahmah because of that be happy Ubay didn't say anything about the Prophet's birthday that's what's authentic about this ayah another thing is authentic as well Abdullah ibn Abbas Al-Imam Al-Tabari who has the best tafsir and the reason why it's the best tafsir is because it's with the chain of narration Al-Imam Al-Tabari will say my sheikh told me that his sheikh told him, that his sheikh told him, that Abu Hurara said this, that the prophet said that. So we have the ability now to look at that chain of narration to see if this is authentic or not. It's the best tafsir. Jamil Bayan. At Tabari brought his chain of narration up to Abdullah ibn Abbas. Abdullah ibn Abbas said about this ayat that the fadl of Allah, the fadl of Allah, it actually means al-islam and that the rahmah of allah is the quran that's the meaning of the ayah with the people of the past we have a tafsir ibn al-qayyim he brought his tafsir he said that the fadl of allah is islam and the rahmah of allah is the sunnah now i'm going to move beyond this point but the brothers who are studying with us the book sharh al-sunnah to al-imam al-barbahari the very first point that Al-Imam Al-Barbahari said in that book that shows us the Minhaj Al-Salafi, what the companions were upon, Al-Imam Al-Barbahari told the people, no, I'lamu anna al-Islam huwa sunnah, wa sunnah tuhi al-Islam, 
wala yaqumu ahaduhuma illa bi akhir you should know that islam is the sunnah and the sunnah is islam and neither one of them neither one of them will be able to stand up without the other one islam and the correct taqid and minhaj they are the same and they need each other they are the religion why did al imam al barbahari say that islam is the sunnah and sunnah is islam Ibn al-Qayyim brought this ayat that we're dealing with right now and he said the meaning of the fadl of Allah is Islam the rahma of Allah is the sunnah so that's what the scholars of Islam understood they didn't understand this new interpretation so that is a dalil that is weak it only comes from people who have inhiraf in their aqidah inhiraf they went off of the mark they're trying to make things fit no taqwa of Allah just say whatever you want to say and give an explanation interpretation of the book of Allah from the dalil ikhwani another dalil that is from the Quran but is out of context is the ayat in the Quran inna allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna 'ala an-nabi ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu 'alayhi wa sallimu taslima they say that this ayat of the Quran when you do the mawlid an-nabawi when you do it when we do the mawlid people come together and we're going to make dhikr and we're going to say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it's going to cause us to be connected to the nabi so because the mawlid and nabawi the celebration makes us say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more then this is the dalil why we should do it again the question that presents itself is where's the intellect of the people prophet muhammad didn't know that ayat the companions didn't know that ayah. As a matter of fact, the khwani, pay attention. The companions came and said, Ya Rasulullah, we know how to say as-salams on you when this ayat was revealed. Give salawat and give salam on him. They said, we know how to say salam. We say, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh, Ya Rasulullah. That's how you give salams. We know how to give salams. But how do we do the salawat? How do we give the salawat upon you? The Prophet didn't tell them, do the mawlid in nabawi He answered them, when you want to give the salawat upon me, say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad, kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim, innaka hamidun majid. So he taught them the meaning of the ayat. That we say when we hear his name, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the ayat, does not sanction people being able to do the mawlid and nabawi in addition to that ikhwani, in addition to that our intellect why do we buy into what these kuffar put over us when they put the wool over our eyes just to make money why do we buy into it father's day and mother's day why do we buy into that the person who waits for one day the 12th of Rabil awwal he waits for that day to say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he is having jafa with the nabi that's not giving rasulullah his haq he doesn't know the qadr the real position of the nabi just like the one who waits for mother's day to give his mother a card and the deen of allah every single day you have to honor respect and pay tribute to your mother and your father every day not just on the birthday or this day or that day every day and the Nabi of Al-Islam is even more than that. He's more than that. And lastly, concerning this particular point, Khwani, we're from amongst the companions that someone take this ayat and give it that interpretation. And they more than anyone, their intellect was stronger, their iman was stronger, as I mentioned to you, their commitment, ready to castrate themselves, and you think that they will hold back one minute of doing the mawlid of the Prophet, this ihtifal. It's not even conceivable. To think that it's possible shows something is wrong with me as a person. To think that I can do something today that's worship, that the companions didn't do, I could come up with it today and do it. And I can't reference it back, reference, reference it back to the companions. If I think that's okay, something is wrong with me. And I tell you, something is wrong with this ummah. Because we believe that this is okay. We don't even see the connection. That it is not permissible, Ummah islam to do a form of worship today that those companions weren't doing on that day. 
It's not permissible to even believe it's possible. But many people, they believe it's possible. And they see what I'm saying as being disconnected and disjointed. That's the condition of our ummah. And that's why we have the confusion that we have across the globe. Change the president in Egypt all you want to. It's not about the president. It's not about the president. You can change the president all you want to. But as long as Egypt, the big city that it is, the non-Muslims know, if you get those Muslim Arabs of Egypt, you knock Egypt off of the map. Make Egypt a back backwards place, a place of kufr and shirk. You make Egypt a place of bid'ah for the Muslims, then you have effectively engaged the Arabs in making the Muslims backwards. That place is strategic. In Al-Islam, go to Egypt. I don't think, and I'm not against my brothers from Egypt, and Imam al-Shafi went to Egypt, and Imam Abdullah bin Wahab was in Egypt, and Imam al-Humaydi was in Egypt. I'm not against Egypt. Layth ibn Sa'd, those people were in Egypt. Ulama. But go to Egypt and look at the Mawlid the Nabawi. Go to Egypt and look at the graves and look at the shirk and look at the bid'ah and look at the oldest institution of higher learning in Islam and outside of Islam, Al-Azhar. Go to Al-Azhar and see what the people are learning as the aqidah of Al-Islam. And that doesn't reflect negatively on the people of the Sunnah in Egypt. That doesn't reflect negatively upon the ulama of Egypt and the awliya of Egypt from the men and the women. But the country itself, the mawlid of the Prophet وسلم, is directly connected to what's going on in the Muslim world, all over the place. Because we don't see, as a, as a nation, it's not permissible for us to worship Allah with what the companions didn't worship him with. As Imam Malik said, what was not the religion during their time cannot be the religion now. Concerning this issue of the proofs that these people use in the Mawlid, they use the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu came to Al-Medina, and when he came to Al-Medina, he found the Yahud fasting. This is one of their strong delils. He said to the people, why are they fasting? They informed him the Yahud are fasting on this day, Ya Rasulullah, because this is the day that Allah destroyed Fir'aun and he saved Musa. So the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we have more right to Musa. We're closer to Musa than they are. They're not practicing the religion of Musa. So he started fasting on that day, Ashura. They use that as a delil. They said, because Allah Azza wa saved Musa and destroy, destroy his enemy Fir'aun. He saved the believers with Musa. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam showed his happiness. He earmarked this day because of this incident to be a day of celebration by fasting. First thing that we want to mention because hand in hand with the Mawlid and Nabawi is the Khurafat and the Shirk that the people have about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Usually, many times, the person who's doing the Mawlid and Nabawi, he has other things, how he thinks and how he believes. First thing we want to mention about this hadith, when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to the people, why are they fasting today? That's proof that he doesn't know the Ilm al-Ghayb. Now they'll turn around and say, he knew the Ilm al-Ghayb, he just wanted to be hum humble, show the people, that's all. He wanted to, the, them to hear it. He didn't have the knowledge of the Ilm al-Ghayb, that's the first thing. Second of all, concerning this as a delil, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not many months after this incident, this was when he went to Medina, not many months after this incident, he had the Battle of Badr. And the Battle of Badr is a day of happiness. It's the day of the Furqan, the criterion between the Haq, the haq and the Batil, the Awliya of Rahman, and the awliya of a shaitan, they came together. Allah called it Yom al-Furqan, Yom al-Furqan, Yom al taqal jam'an. He called it the day of Furqan, day of happiness. After the victory, did you see the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam every year taking that day as a day of celebration and remembrance? Did you see the companions after that 
every year afterwards, taking the day of Bedr. And where and when do we stop? This battle, that battle, his son was born over here. Where do we stop? Where do we stop? The other thing is, how do we use this as a delil? When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, he allowed the people to fast on Ashura, but he didn't say that you can take the 12th of Rabi'l Awwal to recognize his birthday. Where did you get the number from? And how did you make the correlation and the connection? Lastly, concerning this Ikhwani, and this is the main thing for the whole topic, to be honest with you. To be honest with you. The authentic hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. مَا مِن نَبِيٍ إِلَّا كَانَ حَقٍ عَلَيْهِ أَنْ يَدُلُّ أُمَّتَهُ عَلَى خَيْرِ مَا يَعْلَمُهُ لَهُمْ وَأَنْ يُنْذِرَهُمْ عَنْ شَرِّ مَا يَعْلَمُهُ لَهُمْ He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and you know Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, when he used to want to tell the people a hadith, before he would tell the Muslims the hadith, he wouldn't just say the Prophet told me, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Many times he would say, Haddathani as-sadiq wal-masduq. I was told by the one who is exceedingly truthful and his words should be believed. And then he would tell them the hadith. One of the hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sanawat khadda'at. The truthful one, as sadiq wal mastuq. He said, there are going to come some years that are deceitful, deceptive. We're living during that time. The year where the haq is passed off as being false and the falsehood is passed off as being the haq. The sunnah is passed off as being the innovation and the innovation is passed off as being the sunnah. The, the issue in Egypt, we don't know what's our position in Islam concerning that. Egypt, people don't know. We base our position based upon my emotions. What the media is telling me. I'm going to make decisions based upon the media. Not, how do I understand this through the Quran and the Sunnah? Because it goes beyond, it's an oppressive ruler. It goes beyond that. Anyway. As-Sadiq al-Mastuq, he said, and what we shouldn't have any doubt about. Allah never sent a Nabi, a messenger, ever except that it was wajib upon that Nabi. It was the haq that that Nabi had to tell his people about the good of what he knew. And he had to warn the people about the evil of what he knew. This hadith right here makes the Mawlid the Nabawi an issue that is clear. Because we're going to ask the people, listen, you heard that hadith. Now the question is, question is, did the Prophet know about the Mawlid the Nabawi or he didn't know? Did he know about it or he didn't know? If they say no, he didn't know about it. All right, let's close the book. You made it easy for all of us. How are you going to worship Allah or do something in the deen that he didn't know about? You think that's okay? Now if the person says, yes, he knew about it. He knew about the Mawlid the Nabawi. He knew about it. Now we're going to ask him the question, okay. Did he relay it to the Ummah or he didn't tell us about it? Now if the person says he didn't relay it to us, he hid it. Then the ayats apply to him. Ya ayyuhar rasul, balligh ma unzila ilayka min rabbika wa in lam taf'al fama ballakta risalata. O Nabi, tell the people about what was revealed to you. And if you don't do it, then you have not relayed the message. And other ayats where Allah threatened him. That if he changed this Quran and what he was supposed to do, Allah would have seized him. Now I'm not doing this, Allah, la. Allah would have seized him by his right side. Now if the person comes and says, the Prophet Wasallam, he did relay it. He did relay it. As we say to the Christians, as Allah said, قُلْ هَاتُوا بُرْحَانَكُمْ in kuntum sadiqin. Bring your proof if what you're saying is the truth. Where's the chain of narration? Where's your hadith? Don't give me the weak hadith, fabricated hadith. Where is it at? So now I want to ask you brothers again another simple question. Listen guys, ikhwani. The man was traveling during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he was fasting. 
And because it was hot, he fell off of his camel and he was affected adversely because of the fast. The Prophet told that man and the rest of the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as a rahmah upon them, Laysa min al bir as sum of his safar. It is not righteousness that you fast while you're traveling. If fasting is difficult for you, you don't have to fast while you're traveling. Do you mean to tell me that the Nabi of Al Islam وسلم, would tell this man who's trying to get close to Allah about this issue and then forget to tell them about the virtues of his birthday and getting close to Allah on this day? Someone may say, but fasting. And fasting, this fasting is a rukun from the arkan of Islam. That's big. Don't give us that as an example. Okay. The Prophet told his companion, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ruwayfi. He said, it may be ruwayfi. That you're going to live a long time. And I may not see you. So go and tell the people. Whoever twists his beard. Twist his beard. He twists his beard. Whoever wears a necklace to protect himself. The one who makes, is, makes istijmar, he cleans himself with the dung or the bones of an animal. He told them, tell the people, anyone who does that, I'm free from that individual. I'm free. If you clean yourself with dry dung or with a, with, with a bone or dry dung of animals, I'm free from it. The prophet is going to tell us that issue. What does that have to do with us here? Because you have to remember the ayah, Umma kana rabbuka nasiya. Your Lord was not forgetful. When he revealed this Quran, he knew what our condition was going to be. And our condition is that none of us, none of us, none of us ever made a stijmar like we were out in the desert and we used dung or we used bones. It's not our lifestyle. The Prophet told us about that. Something we're not even using. We know it, but if we had to use it, we know. But none of us are doing it. And yet, he was quiet about telling us something we need to know. How to express our love for him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No, Wallahi, by the Lord of the Kaaba. Islam is not that ignorant. This religion is above that. The legislation of Islam, the knowledge of Allah, the justice in the way he has legislated and what this religion is all about. When we look at those scholars, one of the reasons why we respect the scholars is that those people have comprehended to a large degree, the reality of Al-Islam. And we're on a level where we just touch the surface, if that. Knowledge and the ulama. Our religion is a tremendous religion. We don't leave it to the whims and the desires of any and everyone. You want to do what you want to do. From the Dalil Khwani that the people use as well is the fact that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked a question, why do you fast on Mondays and Thursdays? He told the people because these are the two days that the Quran was revealed upon me and I was born on that day. We don't know if he was born on Monday. We don't know if he was born on Thursday. We don't know if the Quran came down on Monday. We don't know if the Quran came down on Thursday. We, we don't know. But that's the reason why he did Monday and Thursday for Psalm. So the people understand, again, the day of his birthday, the day of his birthday, the day that he was born, it was a day that he chose to do something about it. Question number one. What does the Mawlid the Nebawi have to do with fasting? He fasted on one of those two days and we're doing other stuff. We're coming and we're singing songs and we're eating candy and sweets and we're putting lights on our homes. What does that have to do with anything? Number two, number two. Being born on Monday and Thursday, what does it have to do with Rabi' al-Awwal? The 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal. Again, we have to go back to that. The 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal. Why that day? Why not every Monday and Thursday, why not do something on Monday and Thursday, every, every week that it comes around? Why just wait for Rabi' al-Awwal? And why do the Shiites wait for the 17th? Why is that? That kind of confusion, that confusion, 17th, 12th, Monday, Thursday equals Rabi al Awal. Allah's religion is far above that. Subhana Rabbi Samawati wal Ardi wal Arsh, Amma Yasifun. Glory unto Allah, the Lord of the heavens and the earth and the great throne from what they attribute to Allah. This is not our religion. Lastly, Akhwani, 
from the adilla that they use because we don't even want to go into the dreams. People had dreams. And most of them are not authentic anyway. But from what they use is, this is a bida hasana. We know and we recognize and we understand that this is not something that you can find in the Quran and the Sunnah, but it's a bid'ah hasana, as Umar radiallahu anhu said. For the people of the Sunnah, we have no problem with Umar's statement, the bid'ah hasana, that was something that he said, it had his context, it had his backdrop, and it was based upon what he understood. The companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam saw what he did, heard what he did, and they allowed it. So there's the ijma' of the companions and that's why that taraweeh the way he did it was allowed because this ummah will not gather together and agree on something that is incorrect but our nabi and our rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said that every bid'ah that is introduced in this religion every bid'ah that bid'ah is in the hellfire it's astray it's rejected no matter who did it what umar introduced wasn't something that was new as it's been mentioned so many times to you and to them the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam pray qiyamul layl with the people in ramadan so what umar did wasn't wasn't something new the nabi showed this is something that could be done thus the companions agreed to it and they left it what he did radiallahu anhu was something that had his dalil and plus in what he did is the command of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam Follow the way of those Khulafa Rashidin. From them is Umar. From them is Umar. May Allah Ta'ala have mercy upon him. There's one more I, I can't fail to mention, although I mentioned it before, Khwani. I think it was this time last year. And that's the istihsan. We'll end with this. The istihsan. Istihsan is when you allow your mind to come up with why something should be done or shouldn't be done. Istihsan. Istihsan. And Imam Shafi'i said, Whoever does this istihsan, he has legislated. Istihsan. You use your mind to come up with something and you say, because of this, this should be done. For an example. There are many examples. For an example. The imam, he leads the salah. This is connected to Egypt as well. The imam, he leads the salah. All of us are praying behind the imam. And behind us are women. When the imam makes a mistake, the one from amongst us who knows that he made a mistake, we say subhanallah. The one from amongst the men who knows that he made a mistake in the recitation of the Quran, he opens up and he corrects him. That's what we can do. That's the delil allows us to do only those two things. The women in that same scenario all she can do is clap her hands. That's all she can do. She doesn't say subhanallah. She doesn't open up for him even if he's making mistakes with the Quran. She doesn't open up because her voice is an aura and that's a fitn in the masjid. So she's not allowed to say that. Now she's in the privacy of her own home with her husband, her son, her maharam. She can open up. But in the masjid, all she can do, all she can do is Clap her hands. Try to give the tambih to the men and to the imam. It's not permissible for the woman to say, Istihsan. Well, you know the Quran is the kalam of Allah. And we can't make mistakes in the Quran. So that justifies what I'm about to do. She can't do that. She only can fear Allah to what the deen told her. You have to stop right there and just clap your hands. You can't go beyond that. With this imam in the masjid. Istihsan, the Quran, you have to have jealousy of the Quran, you have to say the haq. All of those are justifications that don't allow her to go beyond this. So what we have in Egypt, istihsan. It's a tyranny, it's this, it's that, let's do this, let's do that. No, with the imam, there's a cert there are only certain things you can do with the leader of the Muslims. There are only certain things you can do. Yeah, but that means that you love tyranny. No, that doesn't mean that I love tyranny. That means that Allah knew what he was doing when he legislated this religion. He knew what he was doing. He knew the position of security and other than that in the deen. So istihsan, they use this istihsan. The istihsan in their opinion is in this dunya 
the non-Muslims, they glorify, they venerate, they take time out to praise great people. Many times those great people are not truly great in the scales of Islam, and that's true. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, we grew up in America, black people actually liking that man. They fed us a lot of nonsense. That man didn't believe black people and white people were equal. He believed that we were subhuman, that man. But when we went to school, they taught us nonsense, just as I'm sure this country taught you people nonsense about history. They show a big reverence for him. How is it that we don't do the same for the Nabi of Al-Islam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And he's better than all of those people combined. All of them, he's better than all of the presidents, everyone. That's istihsan. Allah knew what he was doing with his religion. The companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, radiallahu anhum, they knew, they knew how to praise the Nabi. And look what happened with Umar. When the Prophet was lying down and Umar came to him and he sat up and Umar was crying, he said, why are you crying, Umar? These are the people who are ready to castrate themselves and make sacrifices. Why are you crying, ya Umar? What, what makes you cry? Ya Rasulullah, there it is, the kings of Persia and Rome, they live in large, and here you are, the Khatim of the Anbiya, the Sayyid of Bani Adam, the Habib of Allah, the Khalil of Allah, all of those virtues, and look at your back from your bed. Look at this poverty you're in. You're impoverished. And Allah's Ar Razak, Dhul Quwwat al Mateen. Look at the tears that came out of this man's eyes just from what he saw. And you're going to tell me. He doesn't love him and doesn't know how to show his love, and we do. The Prophet said to him, Ya Umar, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what do you think? What do you think? That the Jannah, the dunya, is the Jannah of the Kafir. And it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the hell of the Muslim. They do whatever they want here. If they want to do birthdays and whatever, they can do whatever they want. In our religion, we can't do everything that we want. We have to do what Allah told us to do. And that's it. And you have to be satisfied with that. That's what it is to be a Muslim. So don't come and do this istihsan about, look at all of those people, they make them great. Nah, the Prophet taught them. The Nabi of Al-Islam, he told the people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in showing this issue about great people and who's not great. He's the greatest one. He told the people, when he walked in upon them, and they used to stand up, he told the people, men, nas, qiyamin, Anyone who wants someone to stand up because he came in, show him some position. Anyone who stands up and he wants the people to stand up, let him get his place in the hellfire. Ibn Abbas, his cousin said, when the prophet would come in, we would not stand up for him because of what we knew, how he hated that. He said to his people, Don't raise me above the place that Allah has given me. So when they do their qasida in the Mawlid al Nabawi, they start saying things that are beyond what's acceptable. So what's this issue about these people of the dunya? They're like this, so the Nabi himself needs to be praised even more. Rasulullah himself didn't like that. He didn't do that. He didn't allow that. So Ikhwani, concerning the Mawlid al Nabawi, let it be clear. Loving the Nabi, and we end with this, comes with the Ayatul Mihna, when the Munafiqeen came and they said, Inna nuhibbu rabbana hubbin shadida, fa anzal Allahu ta'ala alayhim qul, in kuntum tuhibbun allaha, fattabi'uni yuhbibkum allah, those munafiq, they came in and said, we love Allah, we love Allah so much. We love Allah, munafiqeen. We love Allah. Allah revealed the ayah, testing them and testing all of us. Tell them, Ya Muhammad, if you truly love Allah, then follow me. Allah will love you and he'll forgive you for your sins. So loving the Nabi of Al-Islam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is practicing his religion, taking his sunnah. And you'll find many of the people who are doing this, Mawlid and Nabawi, make ship with Allah. They don't pray. They don't wear hijab. The Mawlid and Nabawi is an opportunity, an excuse to have a party. The girl comes in, the daughter with hijab, jilbab, niqab, and the mother and the father are against them. 
The boy starts to leave his beard, praising the masjid. The mother and the father are against him. And then they're going to come and say, Mawla the Nabawi, Mawla the Nabawi. We love the Nabi. So perfection is only with Allah. Everyone is making mistakes. But one of the mistakes that we have to really avoid staying away from is the mistake of innovation. Innovation. The hadith said, Inna Allah qad ihtajaba at-tawbata an kulli sahib bid'atan hatta yada'aha. Allah has put a hijab, a veil, between the person who is doing an innovation. He won't make tawbah. Between the individual doing innovation and his innovation, Allah put a veil between him. He will never leave the innovation alone because he thinks what he's doing is correct. He thinks what he's doing is correct. This is what we want to present in the way of defending the sunnah, in the way of making our position clear in the different issues that you heard about Abu Bakr and other than Abu Bakr and Taqlid and what you've heard about who the prophet was and issues like that. We have to get away from this religion of the culture. Many of these ideas have crept into our religion from Sikhs and Hindus and non-Muslims who are from Africa and Arabs who are ignorant. The Sunnah is what the Prophet brought, the purity of the Sunnah, the Muhajjat al bayda That's what he called it. Inni taraktukum al Muhajjat al bayda Layluha kan naharihah. La yazigu anha illa halik. I left you on a religion that is crystal clear. Its nighttime is like its daytime. No one will deviate from it except he will be destroyed. He didn't leave us a religion of confusion like the Yahud and the Nasar. When they speak, you say that doesn't make sense. And Allah, my Lord, is A'la and A'lam. And we ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to give the Muslims our rushd like we used to have it, put us back on guidance on the way of the Salaf al -Salih. Um, we'll open up the floor for questions in uh, of short questions answer session in just a minute inshallah. Just a couple of important announcements. Um, as Abu Wasama mentioned during, during the lesson, um, he also has an Aqidah class which takes place on Sundays and Tuesdays after Salat al-Isha. So just as this um, Doris was connected with our beliefs and what we do believe and what we don't believe, if anyone wants to take benefit of Sheikh Abu Wasama's other lectures on Sundays and Tuesdays after Saturday Isha, then I encourage you to um, attend those. Also, next week's lesson will be delivered by um, Buddha Abdul Karim, and the topic is the manners and the etiquettes of a student of knowledge. So I encourage you all to attend that next week after Saturday Isha on Saturday, inshallah. Are there any questions? Concerning the Qasida al burda it's a Qasida that's been introduced to the Muslims, it's memorized, it's paid attention to, and in it is kufr and shirk. And in it is ghulu that is not loved by Allah and not sanctioned by the sunnah of al Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. Those of you who are in the university, as I heard recently, some of the ISOCs, they want to bring people to explain this particular Qasida. You shouldn't participate in helping people to come to spread shirk and kufr. Shouldn't. That Qasida is dalala. It goes overboard in who the Prophet was. It makes him equal to Allah Azza wa Jal, even above Allah. So the Qasida al burda is the, the Qasida of the, uh, of the uh, Heskarf. It's how you can loosely translate it. The person of a Tawheed, the child who was born and he was raised up drinking the milk from a lady of Tawheed and the father was a Muwahid of Tawheed in that house. They had Tawheed, they made mistakes. But those kids, when they said, Wallahi, that meant something to those kids in that house. If someone said, say, Wallahi, they, that meant something. Their religion was not the religion of Shirk and Kufr, these types of qasaid, these types of poems and poetries, trying to learn them. Uh, 
he has an aversion to it. He has an aversion to it. And that's what the Prophet told his companions, Radiallahu anhum ajma'in. Akhwaf ma akhafu alaykum al shirk al askar. The thing that I'm afraid for you people the most is the small shirk, the minor shirk. And they said, What is that? He said, Riya, Riya. Many people fall into Riya, especially with this uh, culture that we're living in. I have to show off with my car, I have to show off with my uh, possessions in my home. So if the Prophet was afraid, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, of a riyah concerning those awliya and salihin, radiallahu anhum, then we also should be afraid of a shirk. We should also be afraid of a shirk. And from the shirk that people look at it as being light, is this qasiyah, qasida, al-burda. Uh, before we take the next question, we just want to let the community know here, since we're one family, those of you who we know and we don't know, إِخْوَةَ The believers are brothers. Our brother Zeki from Sudan, he was gone. He left, he came back, just saw him today. He finally got married, alhamdulillah. So we want to welcome Zeki back with a robust and healthy welcoming. Inshallah, we're going to do something special for Zeki for finally completing half of his deen. Barakallah fiqh ya Zeki. Akhi ajmal. My brother Ajmal, who I have confidence about his knowledge, and now he's coming out in public, I would think that he knows, we'll go back and check it. I said during the talk that the Prophet said he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was born on Monday or Thursday. Those are the day that I was born on and the Quran was revealed. He said that there's an authentic narration in Sahih Muslim that makes the tahdi, the exact date, is he was born on Monday. So I trust that brother, but we're going to go back, we're going to check it out. And if we found that that was right, that's new knowledge for us. And I find it amazing, I find it amazing that we don't understand scholars of Al-Islam, as I mentioned, every single one of them, they make mistakes and they change their positions. And there's nothing wrong with that. And if you make the mistake in public, you should rectify it in public because you're talking about Allah Azawajal's religion and you don't want the people to be misled. You don't want the people to be misled. So we have to stay in the middle in regards to these issues. Anything that was said in public, just bring me the dilil. We'll be more than happy to rectify it. And when we see Al Albani, Al Albani said that hadith is authentic. And then over here he said that the hadith is weak. And what? And what? That shows he's a human being. Maybe he just made a mistake and he contradicted himself. Maybe he had that opinion and then he changed it later on. Allahu alam. Sometimes we know what happened. So having various opinions as Al Imam Ahmed and Al Imam Abu Hanifa and Al Imam Malik and Al Imam Shafi, they all had that. So there's no problem. Jazakallahu khairin ya akhi ajmal. If you can bring that for me uh, as soon as possible, I would appreciate that. We may forget. No, of course not. This is not an innovation, my brother, at all. Not at all. The reason for that are many. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us in the Quran when he said, Cooperate and help each other to have righteousness and to fear Allah. And don't cooperate and help each other in doing wrong and oppression. So when a Muslim is doing something wrong, it's the responsibility of the other Muslim who knows about that to stop that wrong in the best way possible. There's a way of stopping the wrong. The hadith said, anyone who sees a munkar, 
a wrong thing, let him change it with his hand. If you can, let him change it with his tongue. If you can, let him change it, hate it in his heart. That's the weakest level of faith. So we have many ayat and many ahadith telling us that we have to help each other to advise one another and stop each other from doing what's incorrect. Then we have the companions practicing those ayat and those hadith, especially when it comes to innovation. So one of the best famous incidents that go to dispel the misunderstanding that criticizing and warning about people falling into innovations is an innovation. One of the proofs of that is when Abu Musa al-Ash'ari walked through the Prophet's masjid Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and in that masjid he saw a group of people over there in the circle, another group over there, another group over there, another group, another group, another group, multiple groups. And in each circle there was a man, the Amir of the circle. Everyone in the circle had rocks. The man would say, say Allahu Akbar 100 times with the rocks. And everyone would say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, making the dhikr of Allah, the remembrance of Allah, which is sanctioned in the Quran and the Sunnah, just as loving the Nabi is sanctioned, remembering the Nabi is sanctioned. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari came and he saw that situation and right away he knew something's wrong with this picture. Number one, I don't see any of the companions with them. None of the companions are with them. But they are making the dhikr of Allah. And there are those who are more knowledgeable than me. So he went and knocked on the door of Abdullah, Abdullah bin Mas'ud. He said, Ya Aba Abdurrahman, Abdullah bin Mas'ud, I just came out of the masjid and I saw something that was good, but it's something I didn't see the Prophet doing or his companions. He said, why didn't you stop it? He said, I wanted to get your opinion. Immediately, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud got dressed and he went with him together to the masjid. He looked at the situation and he assessed it in the Prophet's masjid. He said to the people, hey you people, ya ayyuhal nas, I guarantee you that Allah will not cause your good deeds to be lost. But I'm telling you to take these rocks and to count with them your sins. Because here it is, the companions of the Prophet wasallam are widespread, they're still here. His clothes are not dry. The utensils that he used to eat from his vessels are still here. He just died recently. He's not gone. And his companions are here. You can go and ask them, is this from the deen? He said, count your bad deeds. You people are on innovation and dalala going astray. The narrator of this hadith, he said, on the day of Nahrawan, when Ali ibn Abi Talib started fighting some innovators from the Khawarij, the narrator said, the people who were opposed to Ali, who were fighting Ali, saying he was a kafir, who was fighting him, the majority of them were the people who were in that masjid on that day. They were those people who thought the understanding of Islam was better than the companions, who thought they can get close to Allah in a way that the companions weren't doing. Another thing, Akhi, about why it is an obligation to warn about these innovations and things in the best way possible without swearing and cursing and, and, and putting people down is that the nature of the innovation is what happened here in this situation. The rocks were being used one day and those small pebbles grew to become sores that were being raised against not just Muslims but the companions. That's the nature of innovation. That number one, it starts off small and it grows until it's something big. It becomes the religion. It becomes a lot of waste of money and so forth and so on. Another, another result of innovation is that anytime you do an innovation, it's going to kill a sunnah or a number of sunnahs in the process. So that the innovation becomes the religion and then the sunnah becomes the innovation as the prophet said sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. So it's not an innovation to warn against people who are falling into innovation by any stretch of the imagination. And again, ikhwani, if anyone has a delil, a proof, maybe I'm misinterpreting or something, you feel free. 
to correct it and say, no, the right thing is this, or you didn't mention this delil, there's a hadith that says this, an ayah, and that's the thing. That's the thing. When you talk to people who do this milad nabawi, it's not about people's hearts, who's sincere. Now, I'm not talking about people's hearts. So why is a person coming telling me I hate the Nabi because I don't want to do it? I didn't say you did the mole the Nabawi because you want to disobey Allah. I'm not saying that. I think that you love the Nabi. I think that's your niyyad. It's good. But the niyyad doesn't have anything to do with anything. But they accuse your niyyad. You don't love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wallahu mustahan. As I mentioned, Ikhwani, this brother, he said that he's seen some of the brothers who do the Mawlid and Nabawi when the Prophet's Adhan, when the Adhan is gone, that when the Prophet's name, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was mentioned in the Adhan, Ashadu Anna Muhammad Rasulullah, they kiss their eyes and rub their, kiss their thumbs and rub their eyes. As I mentioned, usually the Mawlid and Nabawi, it just doesn't stop with the Mawlid and Nabawi. If you've gone to one of those sittings, you will see all kind of things. The dhikr, huwa, 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 that thing. Khidr comes, Prophet Muhammad comes. I was a new student in Medina, still in the language program. I was connected to some people from Sudan. A lot of Sufism there. Brother took me to what I thought was a dinner, but it turned out to be a celebration of the Mawlid because they were making dhikr. When they came to a part of the Qasida where the Nabi comes in at, they all stood up. I didn't understand the Qasida. I couldn't understand Arabic at that time. And even if I was right now, I probably can't understand that poetry. I didn't get up. I asked the, but everyone got up and I knew it was a problem. They all got angry with me, the older, the elder people. One old man, I mean, he was old. He was very animated and passionate. He was going to jump on me because I wouldn't stand up. So I asked them, why, why I have to stand up? They said, Rasulullah came in. I said, Allah Akbar. I stood up and left. Now, the mawlid just doesn't stop at just one thing. It's these other things that are included in it. It's the yarmi. It's the khatam. It's all of those issues. All of those issues. Starts off as something small, and it becomes multiple things that become big. So there are some fabricated hadith that people made up. That if you kiss your thumbs and you rub your eyes, you won't go blind. I know a man who came to the Sunnah from Sudan, from Sudan because of this issue. He used to do that and he went blind. And he knew that this was Kedem without looking in the chain of narration. Because the Prophet is a sadiq wal mastuq, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If he said, person who kisses his finger through his eyes, he won't go blind, that's not going to happen. That's what's going to be the case. And how many people will we know who are blind? Who, you know how many people will come into Islam if that was true? Just that by yourself. Just tell people, say, when Muhammad just, just do like that and your eyesight will come back. This is not something that is, this is ridiculous. May Allah help us. May Allah help us. Any more questions, Ikhwani, before we uh, wind this thing up? A taqlid simply means taking someone else's opinion and you don't know what their delil is, what their proofs happen to be. You ask the person, Raf al-yadain in salat, should I do it or not? He says, no. And you just don't do it because he said it. He says, yes, and you do it because he said it. You don't ask him, where's the proof? Nor do you go back to check it out yourself. Nor do you go back to check it out. Even if he's a good person, a scholar, and you trust him, and he says yes or no, and he doesn't provide you with the delil. He doesn't provide you with the deal. You don't know the delil. He's basing it on a delil. Don't tell me that's ittiba. For him it's ittiba because he knows what he's doing. He knows why he's doing it. But you the one who asked the question. That's not ittiba in your case until you know why you're doing what you're doing you know why 
You may not be able to regurgitate it. You may not be able to say it off the top of your head, but you know it's there. But when you say, this man right here is a man of the Sunnah, Al Imam Al Bukhari, he said this. And more than likely, he's going to be relying on a delil. I don't have to ask him the delil. La. Then you're making taqlid. And I'm of the opinion that it's permissible to make taqlid in issues you don't have the ability to understand. You don't have the ability to understand. There's an issue, you don't have the ability to comprehend it. So you go to someone who you trust and you say, look, I'm in this situation, this was brought to me. Well, what do you think? He says, this is that. You take that position. So-and-so is whatever the point or the issue may be. But when you make taqlid and you take that position, just don't fight and argue and debate about your position because you are ignorant. The muqallid taqlid is a sign of ignorance. It's a sign of ignorance. And the ulama of al-hadith, they used to look at taqlid the same way that they used to look at eating a dead animal, carry on. You only resort to it out of necessity. Only out of necessity. Now, in our masjid, we have students of knowledge who are allowed their points of view. I know that there are some scholars who have the opinion that there's no taqlid and they give their points of view. At the top of the list, Al-Imam Ibn Hazm, who was really strong on this particular issue. The delil that they use and the delils that they push away, I'm not convinced that if you go and you ask a person and you don't know what his delil is, I'm not convinced that that is al -tiba. You become a mutabi when you know and understand the delil. You know what it is and what the point was. And it doesn't have to be in all of his details, but you know that something is there. Abdullah bin Mas'ud, Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu, he was asked a question about the duha prayer, salatul duha, a duha. They said, what's your position about that? He said, it's an innovation, muhdath. It's an innovation. So the one who asked him that question, he doesn't ask for any delil. He says, okay, and he walks away. That's Abdullah ibn Umar, who's known for his tenacity in following the Sunnah. We're going to call that ittiba. Because Abdullah ibn Umar gave the fatwa and he is who he is. No, there was some fault in his comprehension of the issue. He didn't know about the hadith or whatever the case happens to be. Oh, Rabbah, oh, Rabbah.